Hello, it's time for the final wrap-up video of the year. Uh, I said I was going to try and finish a book before the end of the year, and did not end up happening. But that's okay because the book that I'm reading, I don't think I it would have it, it would not have made this list anyways. That's so it's fine. It doesn't really matter. It was more just a personal disappointment. I let myself down, so that's okay because I'm anyways. Uh, so I read twelve things this year that I would give like a, like a five star solidly a five star I, there are things I more things than that that I gave five stars to on Goodreads but Goodreads doesn't have half stars so the things that I would give like a like a true five star rating to there were 12 so two honorable mentions and then a top 10 how's that sound two honorable mentions I won't go into as much so the first uh, honorable mention uh, is Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell which was first published in 2004 this is a very well-known, popular piece of science fiction, kind of, partially. Sp science fiction slash historical fiction slash just fiction. And it was made into a movie by uh, the Wachowskis, which I haven't seen, but I would like to. Uh, now that I've seen it, now that I've read the book, I'd be interested in seeing that. Also, David Mitchell um, was one of the writers on the new Matrix film. He also wrote for the Sense8 show that the Wachowskis did. That was the last thing that they did before Lana made the new Matrix film. So Cloud Atlas is a sort of uh, series of related stories. Um, it's almost like novellas piece together, um, and to take place over the course of hundreds of years from, uh, the 19th century through modern day into the near future past a point of societal collapse to a sort of post, uh, apocalyptic world as well. And all of the stories are kind of related in some way. They they flow into each other. Like, uh, for, for instance, one of the stories you find out later is a literal book that was written by a character in one of the later sections. And, um... Lots of things repeat. Lots. Of, it's it's implied that people are perhaps like reincarnating, which is I know that's an element of the movie, where they have the same cast for each of the different time sections, and then the same actors playing different characters in each uh, each section. Which I'm I'm really interested to see how they handle that. It sounds really cool and interesting. Um, this is a really really enjoyable read. Um, it just like I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> didn't necessarily resonate as strongly with me on like a really deep level as some of these other books did which is why it's just barely not on this list uh the other honorable mention i have i would say the same thing about that it's 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 extremely well written but it didn't necessarily resonate with me that much emotionally which is jr by william gaddis um this is one of those books that I've been carrying around for for like half of my life. Because when I was a teenager and I read uh, Infinite Jest for the first time, I got really fascinated by postmodernism and like maximalism and long experimental postmodern books. And uh, Gaddis was kind of like the originator of that with recognitions, sort of like the bridge between modernism and postmodernism. <clears throat> obviously a huge influence on, like, Pinchon and, and stuff. And so J.R. Uh, is, like, his second most famous popular book. Uh, won the National Book Award when it came out in 1975. And it's also very long, though it's not as long as the recognitions. It's, like, 
is over 700 pages long. And so uh, it concerns uh, largely a young boy, he's like 10, I believe, named JR, who, uh, with a single piece of stock that he gets after going on like a class field trip to this company, he lives in Long Island, but they go into the city. He's able to start a paper company over the telephone with all of these, like, fake identities and stuff, and build this empire of nothing, this, like, house of cards. <clears throat> and there are a number of... It's a big ensemble cast. There's uh, this guy who is, uh, like, a teacher at his school who uh, is, like, a musician who gets kind of, like, roped into his schemes and his sort of romantic pursuits, and then there's his this teacher's friend who's, like, a failed novelist. That's, like, an obvious author surrogate for Gaddis. And, um... J.R. is just sort of, like, this walking, like, ro roving whirlwind of chaos that just destroys everything that he touches. And it's this... It's, it's meant to be a very, sort of, uh, cheeky sort of satire of American capitalism and, like, Wall Street culture and stuff, something that has just only gotten worse and worse and worse and worse in the f almost 50 years since this book was published. You know, this was before, like, Gordon Gecko and, uh, like, uh, Patrick Bateman or, uh, even real people like, uh, Jordan Belfort, you know, became, <clears throat> you know, subjects of other critiques of the same world. And I did enjoy the book a lot because it's it's f astonishingly well written. It is written almost entirely in unattributed dialogue, and so that means that like people are talking, but it doesn't say, you know, said John or whatever at the end. And there's no quotation marks. He uses m dashes instead of quotation marks. So it's hard. You have to sort of figure out who's talking and who they're talking to, and where they are where they are. And if they are moving from place to place based entirely on, like, context clues from the dialogue, it, it has a sort of steep learning curve to read the book, I would say. It's not, like, impossibly hard. It's not going to, like, break your spirit, you know? I, I took breaks from reading it. I read it over the course of, like, a week and a half, and I think there were, like, two times I put it down and read something else for a day or something. Yeah, it's it's tough at first, but once you kind of get the hang, the rhythm, once you start learning the characters, and you can start to recognize their voices, their speaking patterns, it becomes a lot easier. Also, there is a guide online that uh, you can follow along with to help you. It's it's sort of synop There's also no chapter breaks. That's the other problem. There there's no chapter breaks or titles or there's nothing it's just con it's like one solid flow of text <laughs> for the whole 750 pages um and so there's like a there's scene summaries on this on the gaddis williamgaddis.org i think is the website so it'll tell you like who's there what where they are and what happens so that that is a good resource to help keep you grounded and knowing what's happening um I had been I had owned this book for uh, like almost ten years without reading it, and so I was happy I finally crossed it off. I think if I had read it back then, I would have liked it more than I did now because I think that I was a lot more impressed by style back then. The truth was that it, that this book just didn't really resonate with me on a personal level that much. It's just like an astonishing accomplishment of the English language, but you know. That's not going to get you high on my list. Sorry, boys. Let's go to number 10. In number 10, we had Cloud Atlas. Now, let's talk about Scorch Atlas by Blake Butler. This was first published in 2009. Scorch Atlas is a little... Uh, fascinating little book. It's, it's short. It's uh, just like 150 pages. And uh, it's described as a novel in stories. It's it's uh, 
uh, that, that's not I wouldn't call that incorrect uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination it's just maybe not um, it's maybe misleading a little misleading so it's a very experimental book very surreal loose sort of uh, dreamlike series of, of stories of vignettes about uh, this apocalyptic scenario and apocalyptic world that these people are in. It's like during and after. It's sort of almost like a perpetual apocalypse that like never stops happening. Um, and it's really gross. Everything is like covered in slime and like goopy and 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 like dark and stinky and very vivid this was a, one of the things that kind of was like a uh, rabbit hole the beginning of a rabbit hole because when you look at um, this book on Goodreads the uh, readers also enjoy section off the side the first three books are um, two books that I would that I would later read during this last year because I kept seeing them all the time in these recommendation sections and then also Jesus' Son by Dennis Johnson which is one of my favorite books of all time and that was what got me to read this and then this was what got me to read those other books um, so big ups to Blake Butler for that I've picked up a couple other of Butler's book books that are like full-length novels um, 300 million was I started reading I read I read a little bit of it but I was I was like this is uh, this is not a not this is not a right now book when I read the first like 20 pages of it and put it down um, but I am excited to go back to that book and other things by Blake Butler he is a really cool and fascinating author <clears throat> number nine we have the novel Vernon God Little, written by DBC Pierre, it was first published in 2003, and uh, it won the Booker when it came out uh, back in 2003. So uh, one of my uh, personal, like off-camera highlights of this year was um, making a, a friend, <laughs> uh, my friend Kristen, uh, who I met this year, and. Um, She's, like, one of the coolest people to <clears throat> ever roam the planet Earth. And uh, when we were first getting to know each other, we were trading book recommendations a lot. And uh, this was this one, and uh, Cloud Atlas was another one that I read because she suggested it. But I knew about that book and had known about it for a long time. Uh, but, but this was another one that she rattled off when... We were listing, you know, like, favorites. <clears throat> and, uh... Man, yeah, this book rules. Um, I really like coming-of-age stories. I've, I always have. Even though I have grown up, you know, I still, uh... I still really enjoy and appreciate stories about teenagers. The book I wrote is about teenagers, um, mostly. I'm just going to read the little Goodreads review. I'm, I'm using Goodreads as a reference, because a lot of these things, it's been a while. It's like, I read this book in March, so it's it's been a, a minute, and so it's some things, it's a little f fuzzy in my mind by now. Um, I said, it's a book about freedom, television, a book about Columbine, a book about Orenthal James Simpson, a book about Texas in all caps, and perhaps most of all, a book about love. I was once a 15-year-old boy who was in love with the wrong person, and this book is so many things, obviously a satire of how media sculpts society's response to a tragedy, but it is so much more human and humane than that description would ever make you believe. Vernon Little as a narrator is the kind of thing that should be taught in fiction workshops when you speak about voice in a character. I don't know if I've ever read a book that has as strong of a voice for its narrator 
except for perhaps Adam Levin's The Instructions. Lally is such a brilliant antagonist as well, and I love how his trajectory mirrors Vernon's. I thought I knew how this was going to end up until three pages before it did, and I was wrong, and I am so glad that I was wrong. Um, so the story of Vernon God Little is about the titular Vernon Little, who is from a small town in Texas, and uh, in the right before the at the beginning of the book at the outset of the book um basically what happens is uh vernon's best friend commits a school shooting and uh commits suicide and um since they can't like hold the killer responsible because he's dead they want to basically use Vernon as like a scapegoat for what his friend did. They they are convinced that he had to have had something to do with it, basically. And so he skips town, he goes to Mexico. And it's a, it's a coming of age love story about, you know, being in love with the wrong girl and you know how every, I think you know everybody falls in love with the wrong person when you're that age because you don't know what you want you don't know what you need it's also a sort of a road story about going to Mexico which is fun it's also like very funny and uh, very silly but but balances it with a lot of very serious and poignant stuff as well yeah as far as like first person uh, narrative like character voice in the style of the writing. This is like, man, if you're a fan, if you're a fan of that, if you're a fan of writing and dialect and like how we can use language to like convey accent and things like that. Um, big recommend on this book. If you're a fan of the Buildings Roman of the coming of age story, big recommend on this one. Um, I know I have a little bit of a of uh, an association with things that are really gross and and awful, and this is not one of those things that is not gross or awful. It's just a, I mean, it's there's there's some violence in it, but it's not like gratuitous. I wouldn't say. So yeah, it's this is a, a more wholesome recommendation I can give you. Number eight, we have the Infernal, by Mark Doten which was first published in the year 2015 by Grey Wolf Press from right here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, so I f bought this book right around when it came out um, because in 2015 I was about to finish college and um, AWP, the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, which is a big conference that happens every year with tons of different publishers and graduate departments and stuff, all doing booths and workshops and blah, 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 blah. They were holding it in Minneapolis that year. And I, even though I was an undergraduate, I knew my advisor, my college advisor, was the person who ran the graduate creative writing department. She founded it the year after I started and quit teaching undergrad and moved to the graduate department, but she was still my advisor for the rest of the time I was in college because, I don't know, for whatever reason. But because I was close with her, she hired me on the summer before to be to work for the grad program because it's a, it's a low residency program, which means that like instead of normal school, it's like um, people come in on site for two weeks during the summer and do like... A super intensive like 12 hour days of like workshops and readings and and all of this stuff and then they fly in a bunch of, of writers to workshop with the students and then every night they have like a this is how ours was at least every night they would have like a reading at the the chapel hall that's like a stage at my college <clears throat> and so they hired me to do stuff like run the sound at the readings and like get people coffee if they needed coffee or whatever like just whatever odd jobs needed to happen and then in exchange they let me sit in on the 
writing workshops with the grad students and the visiting authors, which was super cool. And then the next year, since I had that sort of association with the program, my professor was like, well, if you table for us, if you if you hang out at the table and hand out pamphlets for two hours, we'll get you a pass. You can go to AWP for free. Easy yes. So I did, and one of the panels I went to was for Grey Wolf, the publisher of this book. And there were a number, there were a couple people there for that panel that I was interested in seeing, but Mark Doughton wasn't one of them. I, I didn't know who he was. Um, and everybody read pretty standard, um, pretty standard normal things. Uh, <laughs> and then Mark Doughton got up, and he's like, okay, I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel. <laughs> he read this excerpt that um, just totally blew my mind. It just totally rocked my world. And it was this section, this little passage, where there's this couple, and they are going to go out for dinner. I think it's like their anniversary or something. And the, the husband is sitting, much like I am, at the desk at his computer, and his wife is standing over his shoulder, and they need to look up the restaurant that they're going to. So he starts typing in uh, the name of the restaurant, and he types in, like, G-A... And then Google autofills the search bar with the term gay rape. And, like, he sees that. And his wife sees that. And then before he can, like, do or say anything, he starts, like, asphyxiating almost. And, like, struggling. And he, like, gets up and he's, like, running to the bathroom. And then he just starts vomiting maggots out of his mouth. Just barfing maggots and then he's like reaching into his mouth because the maggots are like tonsil stones are like stuck to the inside of his throat and he's like scraping the maggots out of his throat and just like barfing them into the toilet and everybody in the lecture hall was wildly uncomfortable except for me i was fucking giddy i was having the time of my life and so then uh later that day i went over to the gray wolf booth and Mark Doughton was there, and um, I was like, hey man, I loved your your reading, and he was like, oh yeah, I think you were like the only <laughs> one that did. And so I bought this book, and, and he signed it for me, and uh, he was very kind. And then I didn't read it for six years, but I did finally read it. I have read it now. And so um, this is a book that is... A lot of little vignettes that are all... There's not, like, a really strong, overarching, like, narrative plot or thrust that's driving you through the book. It's all kind of about uh, the War on Terror. Each chapter is told from the perspective of a different character. Some of them are fictional characters. Um, some of them are real-life people who are important figures in the War on Terror, like... Osama bin Laden is, like, one of the main characters of this book. Um, but then also there are characters that are real, but they're not uh, portrayed the way that they actually are. The main one being Condoleezza Rice, who is a major character in this book, but uh, in this book she is not a politician. She is uh, a disabled photographer who uses a wheelchair and um one of the main care other main characters of the book is her she's adopted and her, uh, her brother is one of the other main characters and she's not ado i don't I'm pretty sure she's not adopted in real life and doesn't have a brother and like yeah so it's 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 very it's very weird and the, the framing device, the, 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 the true through narrative, is that they f at the beginning of the book, they find this child in the desert in Afghanistan, I believe, uh, on top of this step, like in the desert. And the child is horrifically burned everywhere. They can't even determine what sex the child is because they're, they're so burned. Um, but... 
uh, th they must be interrogated. You know, um, that is not an option. You have to get the inf what inf whatever information you can get out of this person. Uh, the American military will do so. But since the child is unable to speak, they need to take drastic measures. So they unearth this <clears throat> previously uh, banned piece of technology called the Memno Sign, which was invented by another character who is a fictionalized version of a real person, Jimmy Wales, the guy who created Wikipedia, who in this story is a evil mad scientist who has been locked up in prison partially because of his creation of the memno sign um which is this machine this like analog machine that like is a bunch of wires that like get embedded into the tongue and on the palate and stuff of the victim it's a torture device and it basically uh like empties their brain out into sh like printed like old uh dot matrix printer style like the never-ending kind of sheets of of text um of just like all of their memories it just prints them all out but for some reason this child is channeling the memories of all of these other people not itself and that is what the book is. And so the book will sometimes sort of like descend into like chaos and like typographical experimentation, almost like text art stuff as the, the memno sign kind of breaks down and like the connection gets faulty and things like that. It's a really fascinating book, extremely experimental in style, but super, super cool ideas, super cool like characterizations and, and, and concepts. Lots of really impressive and fun experimentation with language and format happening. And, um... Yeah, guy vomiting maggots. So, like, you know, what else can a guy want, really, from a book? Next, we've got the last book that I actually finished this year. Um... I finished it back in July. It is called Bonding by Maggie Siebert. Um, I did a review of this book. I have hyped it in many videos. And um, it went out of print very quickly after it was first released, um, which was unfortunate. Uh, you know, um, but I have good news. Earlier today... It was announced that Apocalypse Party Press will be re-releasing the book next month in February with new art. Um, so soon you can pick up a copy of this really fantastic book. This is a short story collection. It's the first collection that Maggie has published. Um, and it's been getting a ton of, of love and praise from other people in the sort of experimental horror, whatever you want to call that, the scene, you know, um, and, uh, it was on Dennis Cooper's list for fiction this year, um, and it's on my list, you know, so, um, even if you don't trust me, trust, trust Dennis Cooper, uh, short story collection of horror, sto horror stories, um, there are a number of really interesting ones. There's one where this person has, like, uh, it's, it's almost like, it's funny because the, 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 the range of sort of, of tone is really wide. There's, there's the one I was just about to describe is very sort of silly, almost kind of like trauma-esque, where, uh, this person has like a rotten tooth, um, like a like a like a bad tooth and it smells it smells really bad and um they end up basically causing the apocalypse because everybody who like smells their breath just like gets so violently sick that they just like vomit all of their guts out until they die and it just sort of like the cloud of toxic bad breath just sort of like expands out and like destroys the world 
uh, which is a very silly concept, but it's handled in a really sort of interesting and realistic way that, that just sort of, like, heightens how kind of campy it is. Um, but then there are other stories that are totally played straight, like Ammon, which is my favorite, which is a story about a kid, a, a child, who the, it follows their the first, like, ten years of their life, and, um, like, the, the child is born, and it's really hot, it's, like, warm, it's, like, running a fever all the time, but it's not sick, and it's crying constantly, there's something wrong with this baby, and they, like, can't figure it out, and then it just, like, continues to keep tracking the, the, the life progression of this child, who's just, like, there's something wrong with this kid, but they can't, like, figure out what it is. It's just very weird and creepy. And then it has this ending. The ending of that story is just, like, fucking crazy. Just unreal. Like, when I read that story... Because the first story in this, I was kind of, like, middling on. I was sort of unimpressed with. Like, it, I, I, was, I was... It had me worried. I was like, oh, no, is this going to just sort of be this it felt the first story felt like a, a a thing that i was guilty of when i was like in college which was writing stories that were like jokes where it's just sort of like a setup and a punchline and i don't like that i don't like that style i don't think it doesn't i don't think it works very well um for me and so i was i was worried but then when i read ammon which was like the third story in the collection i think i was like oh shit no this is like we're in we're in some goaded territory here, for real. Um, so yeah, this was my favorite story collection I read all year, and I read a couple. And, uh, you know, Maggie uh, is super talented, um, and she's got more stories that have come out. She said um, on Twitter that she's, she's working on a novel, and she's got it more stories to the point where she might have another collection. She's saying that either of those things are potential, could happen within the next year, which is very exciting. So keep your eyes peeled on that. Keep your eyes peeled on Apocalypse Party. Pick this book up when it gets reprinted next month uh, because it is 110% worth your time and money. And uh, and Maggie's so young. She's like 26 or 20, I think. Like, mid-20s. So, like, man, she's just going to it's nowhere to go but up, you know, and and that's really exciting. I'm really excited to to be here at the ground level and follow along and see where we go. At number six, we have Stoner, written by John Williams, and this one was first published back in 1965. So this is a pretty famous book. It's something of a modern classic. New York Review of Books classics put out the, the paperback that's you know in print of it currently is an nyrb edition um fun fact i found out that uh one of my college professors not the one that was my advisor who i was talking about before but the 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 other who was another professor who was sort of almost like my advisor we, we had a very similar, close relationship and collaborated a lot and stuff. But she went to... Uh, her, John Williams was one of her professors in college. Um, in Colorado, I believe. Um, so she, she studied under him. And so I, I when I posted that I was reading this book earlier in the year, she, she commented and told me that, and I was like, oh, fuck, that's awesome. Um, so... John Williams' uh, Stoner is a novel about the life of the titular William Stoner, who uh, comes from a, you know, small Midwestern farm family, goes to college, discovers his love for English literature, studies English literature, becomes a professor, teaches English literature, and lives a life of largely little consequence. Um, and we're told all this at the outset. We're told that William Stoner, you know, lived to be X age and did this. It's basically like a, a, a eulogy for him. He did these, you know, modest accomplishments and died, you know. And then we go back and we sort of go through the whole thing more 
closely. Um, and so it doesn't sound super compelling. You know, this isn't a uh, plot that's going to jump up and make you shout, oh man, I can't wait to read that. But what this book really is, is a intensely moving portrait of the minutia of life and of the, ex the experience that most people have when they live life, which is an experience of insignificance, but I don't want that to sound like a mean or bad thing, just in the sense that most people, you know, they have a sort of small footprint on the world, you know? There are, there are p other people who they affect and change and are important to, and, and, but, but they're not, not everybody is a celebrity, you know, not everybody is going to write a book that changes people's lives, you know, not everybody is going to have huge success, uh, most people are not, and most people, I think a lot of people, are deeply disenfranchised by that, they're deeply disappointed and and ashamed of themselves for feeling, they feel like a failure, you know, they feel like they had the potential uh, to do something really great, and then they didn't, you know, and uh, I certainly have felt that way, uh, and I certainly have had it uh, reinforced by certain people in my life and the way that they uh, spoke to and treated me when I was young. Uh, the ex-gifted kid vibe is a real thing. Uh, and uh, this is just sort of a little love letter to that world to that life, the life of little consequence, and it's John Williams reminding us that there is consequence and import and uh, significance to that kind of an existence, and that there is beauty in it, and that the sadness of it is real and justified and... Yeah, I don't know. This is one of the only things this year that made me, like, full-on, like, cry, like, real bad at the end. Uh, it's, it's pretty sad, you know? Uh, but I think that I, I talked about this in the tag video I did earlier in the week for a book that I really liked that uh, would have, like, a wide appeal that I would re recommend to most people. And I think this does, because it's there's nothing here that is going to, like, filter people out based on content, and I think that the feelings and uh, ideas that are being explored here are very universal. They're very relatable, and most people would probably enjoy this book and get a lot out of it, so, yeah. <sighs> Number five. We have the second book by Ben Marcus, published in 2002. It's Notable American Women. Um, it's kind of debatable whether Age of Wire and String is a story collection or a novel. I think it's generally marketed as a story collection. Um, it's not really either. It's really just its own, truly its own beast. The, that book is indescribable. I need to reread that book and do like a review of it or something. It's, it's one of the wildest things I've ever read. Fascinating book. Um... But this was the first, like, novel, narrative novel that Ben Marcus wrote. I didn't... I, so, The Flame Alphabet, his second novel, one of my favorite books of all time. Just, just, uh, really, really, really deeply, 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 deeply love that book. Um, this book I didn't like quite as much, but I still liked it quite a bit. I mean, here it is at number five on this list. Um, but... Uh, it's, it's, it's a really f weird and fascinating book that's really beautifully written, which is what I have come to expect from Ben Marcus, and he seems pretty much always capable of delivering. And so um, the book takes place uh, on a uh, small farm commune 
in Ohio. And at the outset of the book, the beginning of the book, uh, the opening like chapter is narrated by a man who identifies himself to us as Ben Marcus's father. And he tells us that Ben Marcus is a liar, that Ben Marcus is a traitor, that Ben Marcus is a deceiver, and that he is not to be trusted, and that he, uh, Ben's father, uh, Michael, has been buried in a prison cell underground in the backyard of the family home, which has now become a sort of convent for this cult. And so it's it's led by this woman named Jane Dark, and the, the sort of concept behind this, this cult is uh, they are trying to create complete stillness and silence to have n just pure nothingness. And so everything that they do is like a form they're trying to do like intensive behavior modification to sort of reach this nirvana like state of, of, of complete stillness, no vibration. One of the things that they do is that they're using Ben. Ben is in the house and, and he's sort of held captive, I guess, by the, the group and all of the women uh, try to breed with him and uh, but but not very successfully. And, uh, there's, it's, it's a very hard book to kind of explain. There's not, like, a strong plot, again. Like, I can't really, like, give you, like, a narrative arc of, like, beats and, and acts and things like that. But it's really good and really fascinating, really weird and interesting and it and it's got a lot of the seeds that I feel like have really come into full fruition in Flame Alphabet. So I'm I would say if you if you've never read anything by Ben Marcus, read the Flame Alphabet. I think that's the best thing he's written. I think it's kind of strikes a, a, a good balance of, between the experimental and the weird and the accessible and the narrative. Um, but if you have read that and you want to know where to go next, I think that this is a very good... I think working your way backwards towards Age of Wire and String almost makes more sense, because it's sort of a, a more sort of linear progression, just in the opposite direction, you know. Next is a book that I reviewed when I read it earlier in the year, so you may have seen that, so it might not surprise you that I liked it. Um... And it is Serotonin by Michel Holbeck, published for the first time in 2019. Um, this is Holbeck's most recent book. I haven't read any of his other books yet, but I've picked up a handful of them. So Holbeck is kind of like the Enfant Terrible of France at the moment. Um, he has been kind of he's kind of categorized as a bit of like an edge lord a little bit. He wrote this book. His previous book before this one was called Submission, which was a uh, book that was about a sort of uh, speculative fiction about um, the French government being over, being uh, the parliament basically being run by a majority uh, of the like Islamic f like f party, like, and then. Uh, it, it, Islam, like, takes over the government and then, like, imposes, like, Islamic law, like, Sharia law into France. And a lot of people were very upset about this and uh, accused the book and Holbeck of being racist and Islamophobic and all sorts of things. I haven't read the book, uh, so I will withhold my judgment about that. I would hope that it's maybe a little more nuanced uh, than those people are assuming, but I don't know. I'm ignorant on the subject. But, um, you know, here, uh, you know, he's still being kind of an ass, um, very kind of Bukowski-like, uh, 
where he is this sort of like surly, horny old guy, uh, kind of a misogynist, but it doesn't quite rub me the wrong way the way that Bukowski does now. I, I used to like Bukowski when I was a teenager, but not, not so much anymore. And this book has, like, you know, stuff in it that's probably gonna, you know, gross people out, like, bestiality, and, uh, but, but the thing that, that it really worked for me is it's, it's sort of like the ultimate, like, uh, like, Doomer book, if you're familiar with the Doomer, the Doomer concept uh, of, like, soy posting and soy facing and, and stuff, if you're a fucking internet person like me and you need to touch grass a lot, uh, the Doomers are basically, like, it's, it's basically, like, internet nihilism. It's maybe a little more nuanced than that, but that's kind of the easiest way to, to explain it to someone who doesn't know what the fuck I'm talking about. And basically, it's about this middle-aged guy who is a agricultural engineer, and he just feels like his whole life has just sucked, and he's never really done anything worthwhile, and all of his relationships have been meaningless, and he, like, can't find any sort of happiness or fulfillment from anything that he does or anyone that he is with. And so he is like, I'm, he feels like he is terminally sad in the sense that, like, his sadness is going to kill him. And, uh, he's taking antidepressants and all these things and nothing is really helping. And so he, like, leaves Paris and then goes back to Normandy, uh, which is a more rural part of France. And, uh, he had lived in Normandy when he was younger uh, for, because for part of his job, he was promoting the regional cheeses of Normandy. And he goes back there because he's romanticizing his past, you know, his time that he was there, you know, decades earlier. But when he goes, he finds that, like, you know, uh, the idyllic peace of the countryside, too, has been sort of destroyed by globalization and capitalism and, uh, you know, the EU and agricultural policies and the farmers are about to have, like, an armed revolt and all of these things that he's then sort of, like, finds himself entwined in. And then it all gets kind of wild and metaphorical and, uh, really fascinating, really miserly, kind of depressive, nihilistic book, uh, that doesn't have a whole lot of hope in it. And I was still kind of, I was still kind of there, feeling there when I read it earlier in the year. I don't know how it would hit now that I'm not feeling that way as much anymore. But at the time, it was quite good and uh, left quite an impression on me. So, uh, yeah. Number three, we have the book that I read earlier this year that like kind of sparked me feeling. It really sparked the like, reading marathon that I went on for, like, three months, uh, which was when I read most of the stuff that I read this year, and that is Channa Porter's The Seep. And it also, I think, kind of started a lot of the... It, 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 it was like a clicking moment, like a, like a moment of, of understanding for myself that started me moving forward in a much faster pace emotionally working towards like healing and uh and things like that from you know the the everything that happened to me in 2020 getting divorced and the pandemic and all of that and like um so i'm just gonna read my i wrote a f most of my goodreads reviews are pretty short but this one i wrote a longer one so let's just read it I wrote this when I finished the book on uh, 420 this year. I had a weird day today. My sleeping was backwards, so I woke up at 10 p.m. and I stayed up all night. And then in the morning, I went out and I ended up, amongst other things, buying this book. As I drove around, 
during the day, I had a sort of moment where I realized that I needed to admit to myself that the path that I was trying to forge for myself in my life was not working, and that I needed to come to terms with that. I was no longer the person that I was when I set myself on that journey, and I had to admit that it was not going to work. Then, almost immediately after this happened, I read the entirety of the seep in one sitting, and I think that it might have minorly changed my life. I walked out the other end of this book remembering that literature is my greatest love, and that I am supposed to be writing, and that the most passionate and fulfilled that I have ever been was when I was in school and writing and reading every day. There is something very me about being cynical about utopia. So this book is takes place in a world uh, after we have made contact with aliens, and aliens have basically given us the technology. It was a, it that was a it was a positive first contact. And aliens have given us the technology to create utopia, where we can be anything we want to be. There's no real problems, pressing m matters with the world. And uh, it follows a lesbian couple, and uh, one uh, the the narrator is a woman named Trina, and. Uh, her wife decides that she wants to undergo this process where she will be, through the technology that the aliens have, she will be reborn, literally, as a baby. She will just become a baby again and forget everything. She'll forget all of, all of, all, lose all of her memories. But she'll get to, like, live life for a second time. And it's this big point of contention. Uh, she wants Trina to, like, be involved with it and have Trina raise her as her daughter, and Trina, like, can't deal with that, and then it ends up happening whether Trina wants it to or not, and then it's, it's, you know, she, it's, it's like death, you know, it's like grief, and so she's, she's grieving, going on this sort of weird journey, and it's like, you're in this utopia, this world that's supposed to be perfect, but you're just, you know, you can't escape the grief and the depression and um so there's something very me about being cynical about utopia i identified with trina immediately and having gotten divorced just a year ago the biggest factor in my life being so up in the air currently besides the pandemic of course i felt very much the pain of being left behind by the person you were supposed to grow old with the miserable wreck that trina becomes in the wake of this event feels extremely familiar to me and who I've been during this last year and some change. And then I began thinking about my own book, which I wrote last summer, and I don't know what to do with, and how both it and this book feature a gun that is being carried around by the protagonist for an unknown purpose, though probably suicide, and, spoilers for both, the gun ends up being used for something completely different and cathartic before exiting the book completely in the climax. And then at the bottom here I say, We do need pain to truly be ourselves, and we need to overcome adversity in order to do great things. And accepting that is something truly powerful, because it makes my struggles feel like they have purpose. Perhaps there is redemption for me, yet this book made me hope for the first time in a long time. There it is again. For that, it has earned its spot on my coveted Goodreads shelves called Favorites. What a day, what a book, and I didn't even get into the Jer Derek Chauvin verdict coming out after I finished the book and bursting into tears before I drove down to George Floyd Square to be in a crowd of people for the first time since the pandemic started over a year ago. <sighs> that was a wild day. This book really... Yeah. Big mood in this book. Um, just because this is a three, I still really want to stress like how, like the top the the top three here are like in a different tier from the rest of the books on this list. I think they're like truly in the upper echelon of things that I've ever read. So 
keep that in mind. My number two and my number one are not much of a secret. I've made them pretty well known, and I've talked about them a lot, too. So I will try and be a little brief on both accounts. So my number two book is The Sluts by Dennis Cooper, which was first released in 2004. So The Sluts is a book um, that is entirely made up of like postings on this website that is for uh, Johns to review different uh, male sex workers uh, in California. And uh, so we get uh, all we get reviews which all have like a sort of format to them and then we have like comment sections. Uh, on the posts, and then we have like forum postings and, and threads and, th and things like that, and private messages, and etc. etc. And so, the book is sort of a mystery a little bit, where there's one specific sex worker who many of the different members of this, for of this forum all become kind of obsessed with, and uh. The book is about a lot of things, but uh, some of the big things that it's about are, like, identity, and so since it's the internet, people are able to lie, and so everybody is an unreliable narrator, and sometimes people are pretending to be different people, sometimes multiple people are the same person, uh, you know, are some of these different sex workers, are they all the same one guy that these people are looking for, or are they not, and et cetera, et cetera. But then identity also, you know, is more sort of a general philosophy about, like, who, the self, and things like that, which is at play here as well. There's also uh, a lot of, like, the transgressive nature of sex, and, like, people who are, like, horny in very destructive ways. I won't necessarily say bad. Murder's bad, but, like, you know... Um, let's just say destructive, horny and destructive ways. This book is very funny at times, um, but very sort of darkly funny. Uh, this book is very, very upsetting and gross and disgusting at times. Uh, one thing this book is not very much is sexy, <laughs> I would say. There's a lot of sex in it, but the sex is never hot. It's always horrifying. I don't know, there's there's something about, like, weird and transgressive, disturbing sex stuff that really, I really like, um, even though I'm not, I mean, maybe this is TMI, but, like, I'm not, like, a, like, a big, like, kink guy, I'm not, like, uh, like, I, I have a, a fairly vanilla set of, of, sexual preferences um i wouldn't say like truly vanilla but not, i'm not like i'm not like truly out there the things that i like are probably misleading in that regard i would say uh but i don't know there's there's just i think that it's the thing that appeals to me about it is like the same thing that kind of appeals to me about body horror in general sex is such like so about the body you know it's 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 about the commingling of bodies and uh when you don't like your body you know when you struggle with the way your body is it can make sex hard and weird because you know one of the the major ways that I have and other people like me have dealt with this problem is dissociation you know the the sort of detachment from the self not allowing yourself to be present in your body uh, and sex kind of you, you can't really you can't really have it both ways right um, but there is something when you have to when you have to be present in the body and you are having sex there is something sort of horrifying existentially for me as a fucked up person uh about that experience about being 
in myself and sort of feeling myself and 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 it's it i just i feel like girl i feel like a monster i feel awful it's awful sometimes not all the time but you know enough I think that's where this all, this is where the wires have gotten crossed, you know, um, and that's why this appeals to me, it feels very real, it feels very urgent, it feels very honest, uh, even though it's not literal, it, 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 it captures the same feeling that I'm having. Yeah. And the language and the structure and stuff is really fascinating, the, the, the experimentation with style and formatting, I really like. The mystery of it super compelling it's 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 approximating the way it feels to kind of fall into like an internet rabbit hole like an internet mystery where you're you're clicking links you're reading comments you're following people by username from site to site and to try and get more crumbs of information about what's happening at least i do fucking weird shit like that so that's this book really captured that feeling, and I really like that feeling a lot, and that's why I really like this book a lot, in a, in large part. So, yeah, this one uh, really rocked my socks off, and uh, cannot recommend it enough. And uh, I'm, I'm I need to read more, so I can read more Dennis Cooper. And my number one book of the year comes as no surprise, probably to anybody. It was published in uh, 2020 by Apocalypse Party, the people who are republishing Maggie Siebert's Bonding. And it's Negative Space by B.R. Yeager. Um, this, the thing, I think, if I could distill most easily what I really loved about this book, it's that it's like the book I wrote, but, like, a better. <laughs> it's, like, a better version of that story. Um... It's not, you know, it's not my story, but there's a lot of the same kind of themes and ideas and beats happening here. Teenagers, small town, lots of drugs, suicidal, uh, weird, surreal, uh, paranormal things are happening. Um, there's even a part where they sing karaoke. That's just, you know, a totally coincidence, but, but it is something that they have in common. So this is a story of three teenagers. Uh in a small town in New Hampshire and uh, four teenagers but there are three narrators and then there's a fourth character who is um, sort of the center fuge of the story and all the other characters are kind of like rotating around him and uh, there are a couple of things that are happening the first thing that's happening is that um, a bunch of kids are killing themselves for no apparent reason. There's like an epidemic of suicides. The second thing that's happening is that there's because there's this drug that's become extremely popular. It's called Whorl, W H O R L. That's sort of like a like a loose leaf tobacco, but it's like purple leaves, and you smoke it, and then um, it's like a psychedelic eh, hallucinogen. But it may have some sort of otherworldly properties that allow you to access uh, the ability to create like portals to somewhere else um, and so it mostly follows these three kids as they're trying to kind of like come of age a bit not die find some amount of happiness or some semblance of like understanding or peace as they all watch this one boy who they're all obsessed with to sort of blaze this path of annihilation and destruction that is just barreling him towards just, just a, a finale of destruction that is unavoidable uh, and he's he, he can't be saved and so the question becomes more like are they going to come down with him you know is he gonna is he gonna are they gonna drown together or not and uh it is a horror book. It is a horror story. I, th I think that, uh, you know, maybe it's not in the sense that a lot of maybe people would think. It's not, uh, you know, like, scary much. And it doesn't have any, like, particular... You can't be like, oh, it's a book about, you know, zombies, or it's a book about ghosts, or... You know, you could say that about my book. You could say it's a, it's a ghost story. It's got ghosts in it. But it is 
creepy and unsettling and weird. And, like, that's kind of the, the hallmark of, of Lovecraft, right? So I think that that means it's horror, for sure. What it is, for sure, though, is just, like, a really moving story about how hard it is to be a young person. And it particularly resonated with me because of how close the experiences of these kids were to my own. Uh, spending time with the, the, the burnouts and uh, being one myself for a time. Uh, and losing people and uh, being afraid of losing yourself. All very uh, relatable and uh, extremely well written book compulsively readable. I read it in almost one sitting. Uh, I had to stop reading it for a while because I had to do a thing, and then I read the rest of it later. Uh, but yeah, just really, really incredible. Here it is at number one, so that should speak for itself. Alright. That's enough for this video. That is my year in review. Those were my books. Uh... If you've read any of these, let me know what you think. I know I know some people have read some of them. Juan has read um, both of the top two, I know, and he's also read Stoner, I know. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you've read any of these and you, you have thoughts, uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, i love to, to hear what you have to say. And thanks, as always, for watching, and uh, here's to uh, better and brighter things in 2022. Uh, it's 5 o'clock in the morning uh, right now, and it is 15 degrees below zero outside. And it's going to get down to 21 below, 22 below uh, in the early morning. Uh, but then it's going to warm up to, like, 1 above. So, at least there's that. Thanks, guys. Night.